I'm now honored to welcome Ronald Lauder, president of the World Jewish Congress. Ambassador Lauder, I want to jump right in and start with the novel coronavirus known as COVID-19. We've seen a rise in anti-Semitic attacks during this pandemic, and people are blaming Jews for spreading the virus, especially online, on social media. Why do you think that is, and what can be done to stop that? Before I even answer that, let me say thank you very much for having this forum. I think it's very, very important. I think it's also very, very important that we are doing it with Kiev and um, you, uh, people in Ukraine because it's a, it's a very, very important time for all of us. Now, the question of COVID-19 and what effect it had on anti-Semitism, there is no question that anti-Semites have used this as a way to, to make anti-Semitism grow. You know, we've seen this in the Middle Ages with the bubonic plague. The um, anti-Semites blamed the plague on the Jews, and many, many communities were destroyed because of it. And one of the communities where my grandparents were from, Mainz, Germany, they had to, they had to leave. Um, great, 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 great grandparents, I should say. But the fact is that, yes, it's blamed on the Jews. The Jews are always the perfect scapegoat and particularly in certain countries in Eastern Europe where it's even more pronounced. What we've seen also, this is coming not only from the right, what we've seen in the past, but also from the left. And it's something that's very, very critical to understand for us. Now, we have a Jewish diplomatic corps. Um, we are 300 people um, and we are in um, almost 100 countries that are all represented by the World Jewish Congress. These young people, the ages between 27 and 45, are going and working with all communities to try to help them in any way possible. And the World Jewish Congress has been extraordinarily important um, for these communities. And we have spoken also with the various governments and spoke about the anti-Semitism, what can be done. You know, interesting enough, also, anti-Semitism, a lot of it, is done on the internet. Um, and hate speech on the internet has increased dramatically. We have spoken with both Facebook and um, TikTok, particularly Facebook. And Facebook has done a wonderful job of getting a lot of this hate speech off. And also TikTok has been very, very much a cooperative. There's still a lot on it. And there are different other groups, uh, different other internet sites that we're working with and it's something that has to be done. But what we've seen very, very much is that the governments are working with us and working very much strongly to try to stop this anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism has been with us for 3,000 years. I believe it will probably be with us another 3,000 years. But what we've seen more and more is that when governments work together with the Jewish communities and organizations like the World Jewish Congress, we can do a great deal to alleviate are you concerned, though, that this will continue as the pandemic, unfortunately, continues? And if so, for how long? I mean, you said 3,000 years. Is that what we should expect? <laughs> no, but um, the great thing is that we've seen now the COVID-19 peak is going, it's starting to come down. Um, it'll take time. It'll take time for people to understand what happened. But also, we are working harder and harder. I believe that... Um, during the next six to 12 months, it'll come down dramatically. We will never get rid of anti-Semitism, but as long as people understand the role of what can be done. But also, interesting enough, we've seen something very interesting happening. Because of anti-Semitism, uh, fighting anti-Semitism, many Jewish communities have united together. Mm -hmm. We've seen more and more the Orthodox and the, and the Reform and Secular working together, which is a very, very important thing we've seen. We're fighting it. The World Jewish Congress is on the forefront doing it. And yes, um, when it comes down, I expect anti-Semitism to come down, but it's going to be a long, hard fight. I do believe that we're not talking 3,000 years. We're talking months and maybe a year or two before this thing gets reaches a point where it was before the COVID-19 well, started. 
that's an optimistic note. Ambassador Lauder, what's your expectation? I have to be optimistic. You have to, because the I'm alternative. Not I have a mom. Right. Well, the alternative is not that good. What's your expectation, though, from countries around the world? You, you've spent a lot of your career, and definitely in recent years, over decades, for of cultivating strong alliances and relationships with world leaders, from Europe to Asia to South America to Africa and ev everywhere, the Middle East as well. Um, are there specific initiatives that you can talk about or that you talk about with them that they can do to help the situation? Well, basically, um, many countries, uh, particularly in Europe, have had different laws, starting with Holocaust denial. Um, there's different laws against hate speech, di different laws against uh, what people can say and not say. They've also been very different, very strong about uh, the far right stopping them from some of their rallies, some of their marches, and fighting very strongly with us. Um, we've seen that in Europe. Um, we see it very, very much. But I do believe, you mentioned the Middle East. I do believe that what is happening in the Middle East between Israel and the UAE has had a major effect on what people think of the Jewish people, particularly Israel at this moment. I, I'm looking very, very much that in the coming uh, uh, coming years, and from now on, there'll be more and more peace between Israel and its Arab neighbors, and this will have an effect very, very much there. Uh, yet, at the same time, I was very disappointed when I saw at the Security Council that England, France, and Germany voted to um, or abstain from the embargo against Iran, which gave me enormously difficult. You know, I want to ask you, you have, just shifting gears for a moment, you, know, you mentioned the UAE announcement and that deal between Israel and, and Jerusalem and Abu Dhabi. You've traveled extensively throughout the region, have met a lot of these Gulf leaders over the years. Where do you see, so you mentioned the, the relationship with Jews, but from a diplomatic perspective for Israel, What's next? And, and do you have any insight into what countries might be coming next in line for normalization? Um, well, in many ways, many, many of the countries are ready for normalization. And the fact that the UAE started, um, I know Israel is speaking with three or four of them. Um, it's not for me to comment which ones they are, but they're all countries that um, I believe we'll, we'll see during the next six to 12 months. The major question is, um, when we talk about the Middle East, what's gonna happen with the Palestinians? There are several that say that we're waiting for Palestinians. There are others that say, look, we're moving ahead without the Palestinians. Um, time will tell. I believe that over the next period of time and um, over the next few years, I think you'll see many, many countries normalized in the Middle East have normal relations with Israel, which I think is fantastic. A lot of them are watching what's going to happen between the UAE and, um, and Israel. Right. And I believe that um, uh, there'll be a, a signing sometime in the near future. Um, and this, um, this will really and truly have an effect. I also believe that when we have prosperity growing, not only in um, the Middle East, but also in uh, Europe and other places, this will have a major effect against Iran. Right. And so, this is an important aspect of, for Israel and for the world. Well, and we all come together this time. And you know what, you, you mentioned Iran, and we saw the tweet just the other day by Ayatollah Ali Khamenei calling Jared Kushner and the entourage that flew on that flight from, Abu, from Tel Aviv to Abu Dhabi, filthy Zionist agents. And we saw, as you mentioned, the UN Security Council failing to reimpose the embargo and to reinstate sanctions. What do you make of the West's failure with Iran? I was very disappointed in it. And, um, and from what I understand now, uh, there is a great deal of question of what, what should be done next, but I believe that the reason why they passed on it is they wanted to be brokers in the future of a new deal with Iran, on, um, a new nuclear deal, 
and they felt that if they voted um, against, um, against an embargo, or really they voted um, for an embargo, so they would not be able to be there to negotiate. I don't know the real reason. I've not had a chance to speak to them. And interesting enough, without travel, without me being able to go and speak to these world leaders face to face, I can't really answer that. Um, I can give you my suppositions. However, one of the things I've learned very, very much, and we have, is I've seen it in my time, of, um, I think I've visited 40 countries so far as President of the World Jewish Congress. When you get a chance to speak to a leader and you speak to them um, straight, you can really and truly understand that they understand the problem with Iran and they're trying to find a way to stop it without having a direct confrontation. Right. You've been a long champion of Holocaust remembrance, and you're largely responsible for the preservation of the site of the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp, many of its artifacts. But with the number of Holocaust survivors around the world shrinking almost daily, what does the future of Holocaust remembrance look for you? And what's the importance of education of the Holocaust in that larger global campaign and fight against anti-Semitism? Well, first of all, when I first um, started working at auschwitz birkenau which was 1987. We spent two years making the, all the exhibits there, a, a place that they would be permanently, that, that visitors can see them. Because of this, when people come now to um, the auschwitz birkenau they see what people saw in 1945. The hair, the shoes, the barbed wire, the right. barrels, all the things. This is a, this is the demo. The the survivors again. I thank the Shoah Foundation for taking pictures of them. But we work with the survivors. Many of the survivors we have on film. And interesting enough, I've just started a um, education effort. Um, by the way, there are many places already talking about the Holocaust. What we have done is we have a, a, a new film working on called The Auschwitz Legacy that's showing pictures of what happened in Auschwitz, that's showing survivors speaking to, in the various countries that will be shown. And um, there's a whole question and answer for the teachers of what can be done. This is going to be rolled out um, this spring and the next fall. And I would like each year on one date, January 27th, the liberation of Auschwitz, that the, this will be shown in all schools throughout the world. I think the question of survivors, yes, they're, they're dying. They're, and um, the 75th anniversary, which I have the honor of being the uh, chairman of and they gave the keynote speech, I've been in contact with the survivors. They get it. And all of them were saying, okay, we're dying, but let me tell you, our legacy is there. We, we bear witness, we, we've been on the film, we've talked about it, and they're there. Right. Um, and the next generation is a whole new generation of children of survivors who are very much active. So as far as people forgetting, they, they will not forget. However, we've found that school children, particularly the third generation, do not know the horrors of what happened. We have to teach them what happened and how and what happened. And interesting enough, it happened because of indifference. Right. Because people were all of a sudden didn't care what was happening. Um, Elie Wiesel had the famous quote, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. And what we've seen too often is people are indifferent. And that's something we have to work very, very closely with. Ambassador Lauder, just to, 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 as we final and wrap up, we're on the eve of the Jewish New Year of Rosh Hashanah. What message would you share with Jews across this globe, across the globe on this New Year, which due to the pandemic will unfortunately see a lot of Jewish people at home, not at synagogue, at home on their own in the confines of their four walls and not with their family celebrating like we usually do as a Jewish people with the big family and the mishpacha. What message do you send to those people today? 
Well, well obviously this, uh, this will be a usual time for all of us. Uh, we can't be together as a family. But my message is follows. First of all, we're one people. From the most religious to the most secular, from the most conservative to the most liberal. We're one people. We have to come together as one people. The second is the diaspora and Israel have to be closer together. We have to be one people together standing up for what we believe in. And there's no time better than when people come together, the Rosh Hashanah, and particularly the Yom Kippur, when they can start to say that we're in it together. And I hope this time, mainly because of all the things happening in the world, that people once again realize that we're the Jewish people, we care for each other. And let us make this new year, a special year, to come together. Let us reach out to our friends on the left and the right, on the most religious and most secular. And let's come together and say, we one people, we care for each other, and we stay strong, our strength is together. And let us look to New Year as a time for all to be together. Amen. And that's a beautiful message to end with. Ambassador Ronald Lauder, I want to I thank say, you for joining us. I just want us. to say I love Israel. I love the Jewish I love the Jewish people. And for me, that's the most important thing. God bless you all. And um, I hope that the pandemic will be behind us. I hope we're together as one people and peace will come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you for being with us. Shana Tovah to everybody. Shana Tovah.